The advice and opinions expressed by the hosts of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. Good morning and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we are live right now if you're watching us and it's Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific time on October 11th, 2023, then we're live right now. If you're watching us anytime later than that recorded, we're still happy that you're here. Uh, there are lots of ways to interact with our live show and with a pre-recorded show if you're watching us later on. If you're live right now, I know for certain that we are live on YouTube and I believe that we are live on my personal Facebook page. We are having an issue with Facebook and we're working it out. Um, and if any of you have ever had an issue with Facebook and you try to work it out with them and you know they are not the easiest people to get a hold of. But we're, we're working it all out. So I hope that you're able to watch this. And if you end up watching or listening later on, we love that as well. Our pod, we podcast full shows to all the places that you get your podcasts. It's a free download and all those different platforms. And of course, everything that we do, picture and sound, is available on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash autism live. Uh, and you can go there and look back over 13 years worth of videos. Yes, it's craziness. We are, in, we are starting our 14th year, I think. I'm so bad at the math, how that works, but I think that's exactly what's happening. We are going to be live for this next hour on a topic that uh, is going to probably ruffle some feathers. I have a lot of disclaimers that I want to give because I think that this is a really important topic and I tend to not hit it all the time because I know it can be very triggering for a lot of different people. But every once in a while we got to delve in, but I am going to give a trigger warning for folks that when we start to talk about the word compliance um, and teaching an individual compliance, it may bubble up some stuff in you. And if it does, I want you to know that this is a safe space that you can come to me with your thoughts and your feelings and your questions. And if you, you know, if you feel that it's bringing up some anger and stuff, that's okay too, because I'm guessing that there's probably some reasons why that's coming up for you. And I want to talk about that as well, because, and you notice that on our topic, it says the top 10 tips for teaching compliance the right way. Because if we are teaching compliance just to make someone be compliant, that is the wrong way. If we are teaching compliance and we're not even mindful of the fact that you cannot teach someone how to say yes without also teaching someone how to say no and how to have boundaries and how to discern whether the person who's asking you to do something, whether it's something to your benefit or not. Now, this is a tough, tough topic because already we're talking about children and especially children who have a language disability or a deficit or a disorder, right? That's the full gamut and spectrum. And, and really all children are born having a deficit of spoken language and understanding language receptively, right? And that sometimes develops, um, but that even takes years. That's when it's in the everything is quote unquote normal, right? So are children at risk for being taken advantage of? Yes. And many of us know that all too well. But on the other hand, do we not teach a certain amount of compliance because first of all, it's a safety issue. If I, I can think of an example of a warrior mom that we all loved so much, but who passed away a couple of years because she was in a house that was on fire and her son had not come out. She went back in to get him and she could not get him to leave the house because he was afraid and it was too much. And so the two sat on the stairs and perished together. And that is not her fault. That is not his fault. But if we could avoid that, if we could avoid that moving forward and have the amount of trust that even when something is difficult for our kids to trust us to leave an area that is unsafe to go to one that's safe, wouldn't we all fight for that? 
wouldn't that be an important thing? And I can come up with a million different examples of, you know, your child is running towards the street and about to run out into traffic and yelling stop and having your child stop is a matter of life and death, right? So there's certainly the life and death issues, but then there is also the issues that are just quality of life that we want our children to be happy. We want them to exist in a world in which they understand it and that it makes sense to them and that they feel happy and safe and that they can flourish. And as parents, who among us does not wish that you could have the situation where you say, okay, it's time to go, let's put on your shoes and let's go get in the car to go to school and that it's not an argument, right? That your child goes and puts on their shoes and goes and gets in the car. The question becomes though, can we get to that while teaching them how to have their own boundaries? And the answer is yes. I, I know that there are gonna be some of you that go no because that wasn't your experience of it and I'm sending you love. But if we can talk reasonably about how can we do it and if you trust me enough to go there with you, then we can make the world a better place for the people that we love. Do we have to be careful? You betcha. You absolutely betcha, and we're going to talk about those things too. But uh, what I'm going to do right now, first of all, I'm telling you guys that we love to interact with you. You'll find our content on Facebook, on YouTube, on Twitter, and about a dozen other sites when it's all working right. We want to hear from you. We want to know your thoughts, your questions, all of those different things. You can always email, email me, shannon at autism-live.com. Um, you can check out our website, autismnetwork.com, or you can go to autism-live.com. Also want to remind you that there is Dr. Ask Dr. Doreen is a website as well now. You can be writing in questions for her show. She'll be back live next week. We've got so much to talk about with her. Um, you can write her questions directly into that website. That goes to Marina first, and then Marina sends it to me so that there's no possibility I can forget it. Marina is like on top of things. Um, so, and we do, we're, we're taking a little bit of hiatus from some of our programming here because uh, we have a lot of things going on, but we're not leaving. I know a couple of you have written and said, what's happening? No, we're not leaving. I could not give up this if I tried. Um, so we're going to be continuing. We've got, got a lot of great guests in the hopper that are going to be coming. So I appreciate your patience and stick with us while we, you know, because a lot of things um, changed when Dr. Grant Piché, uh repurchased CARD and um, I'm involved in that, and so we're just splitting our time equitably between a lot of different things. And so I appreciate your, but we're not giving up on this at all, at all, at all. There'll be more content coming. Okay, so uh, I do wanna go now though, I'm gonna go through my top favorite tips for teaching compliance the right way. I'm not gonna overly explain them because this is just for those of you who, you know, you wanna hear it, like what's the deal? But the baseline for all of this is that it has to be fair. And you guys know if you watch this show, this is what Dr. Grampiche says all the time. I am, she is my mentor, I am her student on this. It has to be fair. And if you are teaching compliance in a way that you look at it and go, ah, I'm not sure if it's fair, then I bet you you're not doing it right. And the right way is that it has to be fair to the individual. The compliance has to be something that gains them good things and it can't ever be something that you, you can never be gaining compliance while you're punishing someone or doing something that is not in their best interests. And we're gonna talk more about that. So let's go through our top 10 right now. Number one, teach the child to say yes and no. Critical, absolutely critical. That is the yin and the yang of it and we're gonna talk about why that's important and how you do it. Number two, catch them doing good. Whenever you see a child that's doing something that's wonderful on their own, uh, you're gonna catch them doing that and you're gonna reward them heavily for that. It's a great way to, to teach um, trust and compliance. Number three, uh, we're going to up the praise all the time. I'm going to tell you the Hank story and about why Hank says to up the praise. It, it, if you have a child that is being completely not compliant, Hank will tell you up the praise and it'll change the equation. I'm going to give you something to try today that you're going to go, holy business, how did I not know about this? All right, number four. Uh, give choices. We always want to give people choices. Even when we're asking them to do something that they don't want to do, we always want to give choices. Number five, we're going to make it fun. Whenever we're asking somebody to do something that isn't their favorite thing to do, we're going to make it 
fun. Compliance should be fun and to the benefit of the person that is complying. Number six, uh, we're going to use visuals so that compliance can be easy because sometimes we're relying on the, you know, what we're saying to them and what they're receiving, and sometimes that can get discombobulated, so we're going to use visuals. Number seven, we're going to reward, reward, reward. This is the name of the game. Number eight, we're never going to punish. Punishment doesn't work. I don't know if you've read the studies, but punishment does not work. Uh, especially with kids, you're not going to punish somebody into compliance. That's not happening. I know. I wish I could explain that to the prisons, but it doesn't work. So we're not going to do it. Uh, number eight. My computer's making it fuzzy there. There we go. Uh, number nine. Uh, we're going to ask them to do something that they want to do. This is the number one key to starting to teach compliance is you ask somebody to do something that they want to do anyway. And then we're going to catch them doing that good, and we're going to do all the other things. We're going to reward, reward, reward. But number 10 is another one of the crucial things. We are going to model having boundaries, which means we're also going to respect when our children have boundaries. This is how we're going to begin to teach them boundaries, though, is by modeling it for them. Uh, okay, those are our top 10, and everybody take a breath, because I'm sure some of you are like, wait, wait, wait. Um, because when you're teaching compliance, you're teaching someone to be compliant and it gets very black and white for people. If you teach someone to be compliant, then they will be compliant even with people who do not mean them well. Is that a possibility? Yes. That's why you have to be completely clear on how you're teaching compliance and you got to teach the two sides of it, okay? And this is part of the guiding principle here is that it has to be fair. If you are uh, uh, and you really got to like look at your motives and say, what am I teaching to this person? What are my goals in teaching this to this person? And am I giving them the other side of the coin as well? That's part of being fair. So when there are times when we're going to be asking our children to do things they don't want to do, like get out of the pool. Okay. It's time to get out of the pool, right? That doesn't feel fair to me if I'm a five-year-old and I really enjoy being in the pool. I don't want to get out of the pool. I don't want to be compliant. So as a parent, we really have to be thinking about, but there are things that the child will get out of the pool for. And so what we're doing is building a relationship with this child where we are always making it fair. Now, before a bunch of you write in and say, but this is exactly how people groom children, yes, it is. That is why we are going to teach the other side where they can say no as well and that we don't lose our minds when they say no. We are also going to reinforce them when they say no, and we're going to talk about that right now. So let's go to our number one. Uh, we're going to teach the child to say yes and no. Now, some of this is going to upset your apple cart a little bit, but one of the things that we've learned over the years is that some of how we teach our children what's appropriate and what isn't appropriate, it's kind of fuzzy. And some of it is because we have these fuzzy things from when we were kids. I think you got to make some decisions about how you want to run your life and how prepared you want your child to be for anything that comes down the pike. I remember that um, it used to be when I was like in my 20s, we were teaching children, nobody touches you on your bathing suit that your bathing suit area is all private and nobody touches you there. And if somebody tries to touch you there, you say no. Well, I think we've expanded that a little bit. It's many years ago since I was in my 20s. And one of the things that I hear specialists teaching is that nobody gets to touch you because, you know, the person who comes and ruffles their hair and doesn't have permission, um, that's not okay too. Now, you build rapport with a child and, you know, um, you, you get to the point where we, we don't want people, like for instance, when your child goes off to kindergarten, there are a lot of kindergarten teachers that do that side hug thing, right? And some kids love that and need that. We don't want to create an environment in which no one ever touches your child and your child never, if they need that, um, is never getting that, right? So you're going to make the rules for yourself, but you're going to be very clear about that and you're going to check in with your child about what is a yes and what is a no. You will see clear signs that if you are giving your child a hug and they are relaxing into the hug and they squeeze a little bit more, that is also a yes. A yes isn't only 
a, a vocal yes. I love the expert who said that for folks that are, we all vote with our hands and our feet, but especially for people who are non-vocal or non-verbal, they vote with their hands and their feet. But we are always empowering them to say no. So if you are trying to hug your child and your child is pushing away, you got to honor that because that's the beginning basis of teaching them how to have that boundary with other people. If you are trying, and this goes across everything, and I know I'm like, you're going, but wait a second. You know, you said to put the green beans on the plate, Shannon, and just leave them there. And if the child is saying no, this isn't counter, counter to what I've said before. If you're trying to get your child to eat green beans, you put them on the plate. If the child says no, the child says no, the child is not eating them. Research shows you put the green beans on the plate like, I don't know, it's 22, 24 times, something like that, and eventually your child may eat them. <laughs> they may take a bite. Can you also later on say to them, you know, you have to have a bite? Um, you can, but there always has to be an out for the child. So what we do is we offer, and it is it bargaining? Sure. Everything in life is a bargain. I know people get so upset, they're like, I don't want to have to bargain with my child. Really? Is everything not a bargain for you? If you go into Trader Joe's and you want to buy something, do you just go, I'm taking it? No. You have to pay an agreed upon amount. It's a bargain. I'm giving you this, I get that. Life is about that. And the quicker that your child learns that, you know, if I'm being asked to do something that, I, you know, I really don't want to try the green bean, there better be something worth it for me, right? So you can still bargain, but honor the no. If they say no, that's fine. And don't argue about it. Begin in your everyday to listen for the no, and sometimes it's a no, sometimes it's implied no, sometimes it's with hands and feet, and begin to listen to that. Don't ignore it. Because if you do, you're telling them your needs are not as important as what I need you to do right now. And I don't think any of us want to send that message, but if we continue to force compliance when we're getting a hard no, then we get this distrust, I don't, I don't, I don't trust you. I'm going to give you two examples, one where there was a place on the play structure at the park that I used to take my son and he would always stop. He would just, you know, they call it a balk, um, you know, when somebody's starting to do something and they just back up and they balk, right? Animals do this as well, balk. And, um, and he didn't want to go. And I gently pulled and he was like, I'm not going. Now there are some parents who'd be like, uh, you know, I'm going to drag you across the thing. I had been already taught, you know, let's take a look at why. Eventually we realized there was a sensory thing and we worked through it. My son can do that now, but we were respectful of it. Let them say the no. In fact, I want you to reinforce the no. That if they're, especially when you can, when it's something that they're like, no, I don't want to. Like you're going to be at the holidays and Aunt Betty is there and Aunt Betty likes to hug and squeeze people and whatever and your child backs up. Don't make them hug Aunt Betty. In fact, very loudly say, you know, we don't, we don't hug when we don't want to. And, and, and then praise your child for like being like, no, you don't have to hug everybody. Good job. That's a good job. We don't have to. And Aunt Betty's going to be ticked. I don't care. I don't care. We're raising our kids to be happy and to be well-adjusted and to be safe. And if Aunt Betty is upset about that, God bless Aunt Betty. And maybe you can pull her to the side and have a conversation with her and she may not get it. And you know what? I don't care. I don't care. I'm willing to hurt other people's feelings for my child to be safe. If you aren't, that is up to you. But I think teaching that yes, is, it, it is equally as important to teach and respect your child saying no. And we're going to build upon this. Okay, so let's go to number two here. So when we're teaching compliance, one of the first things that we want to do is um, catch them doing something good. And our kids are engaged in good so many times in a day, so many times in a day. And it can be just a second of good. It can be, I, I love the way you're sitting there um, really nicely with your brother. Uh, I love the way you put on your shoes today. I love the way you woke up and you smiled. Um, I love the way you're eating those eggs, whatever it is. Um, my dear friend, Joanne Laura, uh, always in her movement classes, she did autism movement therapy and, and they would do movement and then they would stop and there would, they would ask questions and they would answer them. And there were a lot of people in her 
classes that were non-vocal and non-verbal and she would pair the movement with asking the questions and you'd be amazed at what would come out absolutely amazed but one of her phrases one of her favorite phrases she would say i like the way you're thinking I like the way you're thinking. I like that. I like the way you're thinking over and over and over again. And it was just, you could see that it just puffed people up. So we want for praise to be something that's important to our kiddos. And we want them to know that we're, we're there, we see them and that we like what we're doing. Now, all kids don't like praise. So you got to think about like what is rewarding to them. Uh, a little bit later, we're going to talk about how we want to build the praise button. But in the beginning, when you catch them doing something good, you want to use a language that is reinforcing to them. So for some kiddos, they love a hug. Other kiddos love a tickle. Um, other kiddos, you know, just love attention, right? So you catch them doing good and you give them some form of, of attention that is reinforcing for them so that they see, oh, I do this. And I put, uh, for those of you listening in podcasts, we've got a picture of Legos here because I don't know what the rest of you, but I love Legos, except when I step on them and except when they're all over my house. Now, over the years, we got good at, you know, we got those Lego mats. Oh, I really recommend those, you guys. That if you've got a kiddo that loves to dump Legos and create, which, man, my kid did, you know, they have Lego mats that you can put down, and then all you do is Velcro up the sides, and it becomes the box for the Legos, and you don't have to pick up a single Lego, right? You can do it you know, really easily. If you don't have one of those with a blanket, you can put a blanket down, you put the Legos out, then when you're done, you pull up the corners of the blankets and boom, and then dump it into the box or whatever, right? Uh, much easier way than having to pick up every Lego, which I probably did for a year and a half, uh, and stepped on them frequently. Um, but the getting our kids to pick up their toys can sometimes be a tussle, right? And a lot of people just go, yeah, that's not happening. Um, I remember that we would have friends come over to do a play date and they would bring their kids over and we would get to a point in the play date and they'd be like, okay, we're leaving. And I'd say, oh, we, we're going to clean up first. And the parents would be like, oh no, my children don't clean up. <laughs> and I was, I was always gobsmacked by that. What do you mean your children don't clean up? Because my kid who was on the spectrum, we always cleaned up and we sang the little Barney song and we would make it fun. I'm going to talk about that in a second, but I praised him anytime he would pick up his Legos and I'd be like, what a good job. Good job picking up your Legos. You got to make it worthwhile for them. So whatever it is that they're doing, and, and I know usually when I say this to parents and they have a child who we don't have compliance in place, they'll go, no, you don't understand. We don't have any of that. And I ask them to go back and look. Look for one thing today that you can praise them for. Now, guess what? This is a magic trick that works with everyone. If you are working with somebody who is being difficult, or you have a friend or a relative or Aunt Betty, the example that we just gave about you're having to explain to Aunt Betty why um, you know, your child is not going to hug them. We're going to go back and we're going to catch Aunt Betty doing something good. And then we're going to up this praise, which is number three. They go hand in hand, right? So we're going to catch them doing something good and we're going to praise, 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 praise. So we say to Aunt Betty, uh, you know, we got, we've got a really difficult thing that we have to do, which is, you know, we're not going to have your, our child hug you if he doesn't want to. And Aunt Betty's going to be hurt by that, right? But, but we notice that she baked her famous peach pie and we go, you know, Aunt Betty, I just love you so much. You are the best peach pie maker in the entire world, and I want you to know it means so much to me. Uh, so many childhood memories that I have about your fabulous peach pie. Aunt Betty will be thrilled. <laughs> that thrilled. I'm throwing things on my desk. Aunt Betty will be so thrilled, and Aunt Betty will, uh, first of all, she's going to make a peach pie every time you see her from now on. Why? Because she knows that's meaningful to you. So pick something you really like, right? Um, but also it kind of smooths over the other stuff, right? Because we all need a certain amount of praise. Now, is everybody's bucket different? For sure. And some of our kids praise, eh, it doesn't mean anything to them. And the reason why it doesn't mean anything to them is because it hasn't been paired with anything. So we do something called pairing where... Um, if, 
in the early stages, if somebody is not reactive to praise, we give another reward, but we massively praise at the same time. And eventually what happens is another magic trick, people um, start to feel rewarded by praise and you can take the other thing away. Works, it actually works. And again, this doesn't just work with people on the spectrum, this works with absolutely everyone, but it happens to work with people on the spectrum too. Uh, and we do want everyone to enjoy a certain amount of praise, right? But remember, we're making it fair. If praise is not meaningful to the person, we're giving them a meaningful reward. But I will tell the Hank Moore story. I don't know if you guys know who Hank is. He is the new um, chief of operations for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. But the first time I heard about Hank Moore, it was because I read Christina Adams' book, A Real Boy. This was after I had met Logan Shepard and his family, and we had not yet started ABA, and I, they gave me this amazing book to read, A Real Boy, by Christina Adams, about her son's journey with ABA. And in the book, she would talk about how she came to CARD for services and she met all these amazing people. She met Dr. Grampiche, but then she had a supervisor on her case for her son, and it was this gentleman, Hank Moore. And whenever anything would go wrong in her life, Christina would dial the phone and call Hank, and, and she would say, I gotta ask Hank what he thinks about this. And she would call Hank, and Hank in the book was like this amazing Buddha of information who always helped her to get back on track and to do things so that her life was better, her son's life was better. And all I, I read this book and I was like, I need a Hank in my life, can I please have Hank? And when I came for my first, uh, my son's first intake and my first meeting at CARD and, and I was like, where's Hank? Even more than where's Dr. Grampiche? Neither one of them were there. And, uh, but you know, eventually I got to meet Dr. Grampy Shea and boy, she didn't disappoint, but I never got to meet Hank. And I kept saying to everybody, where's Hank? Is Hank here? And they would say, Hank, you're looking for Hank? Hank, you know, works at another office and Hank's not here. And then came the day that I, I had already started working for CARD. My son had already graduated from CARD and they walked me into a conference room because we were going to hear this lecture that was going to be online as many years ago and they said oh Shannon I don't know if you ever met Hank Moore and I lost my mind it was like they'd introduced me to Bono I was crying I was like are you Hank are you the Hank are you really and if you know Hank Hank is like the most centered person and he was like yep I'm Hank and and he knew because there have been parents over the decades that have read this book and just like Hank, right? Um, and Hank is famous for many things. And one of the things that he's famous for is this phrase, up the praise. I remember after starting to work at CARD and somebody, there was a meeting where they were talking about a child that was having a particular difficulty and the parents were really, they were like, you got to help me because I, like I, you know, he doesn't do anything that I need him to do and our lives are terrifying. He's going to run out of traffic. What are we going to do? And Hank just happened to be walking through the hallway and, and like a very skinny Buddha, he said, up the praise. And I went, what? You're not, you're not talking about this, right? Because we're talking about the child not being compliant. And he said, yes, but the answer is always to up the praise. And it is this beautiful, uh, once you start to understand that, oh, upping the praise actually helps the, the child who doesn't want to do anything you want to do, um, you begin to understand, oh, it wasn't fair. It wasn't fair. There wasn't enough in it. So... Learn how to up the praise for everybody in your life. And, and I encourage you to not start this with your child that's on the spectrum. Start it with somebody else. Whether it's your significant other, pick something that your significant other is doing that's driving you crazy that you wish you could be like, I wish you would stop doing that. And maybe you even talk to them about that. I have a friend who their husband, my husband doesn't do this, but their husband would just leave his socks laying on the floor. The rest of the clothes he put away, but he just would leave the socks on the floor and for whatever reason it just pushed her button. And she asked him for years and said, could you, please, could you just pick up your socks? And he wasn't doing it. And we played this game and I said, go praise him for something else that he's doing. Up the praise just in general. Like every time he does something that you really love, like, you know, he takes out the trash every week and you go, thank you for taking out the trash and notice if anything is different. Within a week, he was picking up his socks off the floor without her asking him to pick up the socks off the floor. 
It's a little bit of a magic trick, but there's science behind it, right? That when we are in an environment where we feel like what we do is good and that praise comes for when we do, we want it more. Don't we all? I mean, it's not the be all end all, right? But we want to feel happy and safe and like what we do matters. And when we see that, oh, what I, I take out the trash and that matters, um, I want to do other things. And this works with our kids on the spectrum too. So first I want you to try this with somebody who's not on, your spe uh, uh, not on the spectrum, not your child. But then I want you to try this with your child. I want you to like try five things today that you can catch them doing good and give them praise and see what happens as a result of that. Just see. That doesn't mean it's not a negotiation. It isn't. It's not a tit for tat thing. Just up the praise in general, in general, and see what happens to general compliance. So we're not saying I'm going to give you praise, but then you have to put on your shoes. Just being clear about this. You just up the praise and see if when you say to them, okay, it's time to put on the shoes, is it any better? And then let me know because I love this magic trick. It is a magic trick. Okay, moving on to number four. Uh, we always want to give choices. I was at a center last week where I was so impressed with what they were doing there and what the BTs were doing. And this perfect example came up that, um, th and this is a child that they are helping to deal with transitions. That this is in fact part of his program that they are working with him because he has a hard time transitioning. So. Um, I could hear in the other room um, that they were doing a thing and they call it a high P activity, a highly preferred activity, right? Something that he really, really enjoys doing, which means he doesn't want to ever stop. And look, we can have that discussion about, well, why would we make him stop? Well, if all you ever do, let's take Temple Grandin as the example, all she ever wanted to do was sit in her room and play with the disc on her bed or draw horses. And her mom said, you have to do more in life. So you need to go outside and you need to muck the stalls and be looking at horses so that you can draw the full anatomy of them. And we know what that led to in her life. We, we, you know, leaving a child to just do the thing that they're perseverating on while it's their passion, I want to let them have some time to do that. We want to make sure that they're able to transition to other things because otherwise when life forces them to transition to other things, they're going to be very unhappy. Because at some point, like if this child, you know, needed medical attention and couldn't be doing the thing that he really preferred, we don't want him to be so uncomfortable. So it's like a pizza dough. We're going to stretch him a little bit and help him to see that you can leave a highly preferred activity and go do something else and not feel pain. Right now he's feeling pain from it. So they've got a program for him in which he's doing the highly preferred activity and when you start to work on transitions you have them transition to another highly preferred activity that's the beginning and you give a lot of praise and a lot of countdowns okay we're going to have four more minutes of this okay we're going to have two more minutes okay in one minute we're going to go do the other thing that's really really fun right and you begin to teach the trust that way that you're and then uh, you know after we do this we're going to come back and do this it's not like it goes away and not it doesn't go in the vault for 20 years we can come back and do this later on we don't have to do it all the time right so they're working on this, working on this, but eventually you need to make the crossover and go from a highly preferred activity to one that isn't as preferred. And this is when it gets a little bit bumpy, right? And he gets to express his opinions about that. And we don't need to judge what he's feeling about it, right? So I was listening to this really good behavior technician working with this young man and they were having so much fun and they were laughing and she was like, okay, you know, we got four more minutes, we got three more minutes, we got two more minutes. Okay, and when we're done, we're going to go do this. And, and he, you could feel the anxiety that was coming up because he didn't want to leave it. And he was being very vocal to her and he said, I don't want to go do the other thing. And so what did she do? She gave him choices. She said, do you want to do this or do you want to do that? And he was vocal and he said, I don't want to do either of those things. I want to keep doing this thing. And she said, I know. 
but we need to leave this now. Do you want to do this one or this one? She didn't say stop whining. She didn't say stop crying, stop having the emotions that you're having. She stayed really neutral and said, I hear you. We'll do this in a little while. But right now, do you want to do this one or this one? And he said, no, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. And she had to stay the course with him. And she said, I know. And we are going to come back and do this in a minute. But do you want to do this one or this one? And it took, I think, four times for him to say, OK, I want to do this one. And then he walked away and he did that one. And then I heard her like five minutes later say, do you want to go back and do the thing? Because they're teaching him it's not the end of the world. But part of how you do that is you give choices. And part of how you do that is that you allow them to have their feelings about things. Because there are some times we don't get to have it our way, right? But this is how she was keeping it fair. She allowed him to have his feelings. She gave him choices about which thing that he wanted to do next. She acknowledged that he was having the feelings about it and could come back to it eventually. This is how we help him so that in a year's time, this kiddo is going to be able to leave that preferred activity and know that he can come back to it. And it will lessen his anxiety. Now, this is a kiddo who's like seven. What difference do you think that's going to make in his life when he's 14? What difference do you think that's going to make in his life when he's 20? But it wasn't traumatizing to leave the thing because he got to come back to it, right? And it was fair. This is what we want to do. And part of being fair is we give those choices. And by the way, she praised him and said, thank you for telling me how you feel. Thank you for telling me that you still want to do this. Which one of these things do you want to do right now, right? He got praise for all of those things, and then she praised him really heavily. She said, I love how you're playing with this toy. I love how you came over and are playing with this toy. Praise, 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 but gave him choices. Okay, number five, because I'm already out of time. We're making it fun, especially when you have to go to one of those not high P activities. When it's some, look, there's things that none of us want to do. Well, that's not even true because some people like to, I hate doing my taxes. I just, could there ever be anything worse? And many, many years ago, somebody I know that was a CFO at the time said to me, Shannon, I just don't know how you face it. Every morning that you go in and you, you know, get on camera and you talk for an hour, I don't know how you face it. I would just die. And I said, oh, this is fun for me. I said, I don't know how you face doing the spreadsheets all the time. I would die. I couldn't. And he said, oh, that's fun for me. Are you kidding me? That's so much fun, putting things on a spreadsheet. And I went, what? So fun is different for different people. Let's start out by saying that. But when you start to know what makes something fun for somebody, I'm going to use the example of my son. If he really hated something, if we made it a task where it was going to be a race, suddenly it was fun. And, you know, at one point we were living in a condo where you had to park on the street, a busy street where people would go by a million miles an hour, right? I would have to help him get out of the car seat. And then, I, and what I would do often is I'd open the doors, I'd take all the groceries, line them up on the sidewalk before I would take him out of the car seat. I would get him on the sidewalk with me and then I would have to hold his hand and take one bag at a time up because I can't leave him by himself on the sidewalk. He's going to be hit by a car, right? Um, and then we would come back and we would carry one more and it was miserableness, right? And then they taught me, they were like, well, he could help. He could absolutely help, but he didn't want to help. <laughs> Why? He didn't want to carry groceries to the front door. Who wants to do? I don't want to do that. So, um, but it was suggested he likes to race. So we would line up the grocery bags and each one of us would pick up a grocery bag and we would do ready, set, go. And we would race down the sidewalk, up the stairs to the condo and whoever got to the door won. And then we would go back down to the groceries and we would race again. And he loved that. He absolutely loved it. So if you're having something where you want your child to comply and you're just not getting the compliance, go back to the beginning and think about, all right, got to make this fair, which means this is a task, right? This is something nobody wants to do. How do I make it fun? I go back to the, the BCBA who uh, used to say to me that she didn't allow Kool-Aid in her house. Kool-Aid, hated it, didn't like it. 
didn't want it in her house. And then her kids started to go to school and she really wanted them to want to do homework. So what she would do is she, she bought Kool-Aid and she got a natural colored flavored one um, because we don't like artificial colors and flavors, just saying. Uh, but it did have sugar in it, right? And she would make a big old pitcher of this Kool-Aid and she would stick it on the table and she would say, when you're doing homework, you can have Kool-Aid. Her kids love doing homework. One of them is in college now and the other one's in high school and her kids love doing homework because she added an element to it that made it fair for them and it made it fun. Kool-Aid, you know, as long as that pitcher isn't busting through a wall, it can be fun. So make it fun. Make it fair. Make it fun. Number six on our list, using visuals. A lot of times, unless you've really tested and understand exactly how your child learns, uh, we tend to all of us tend to be very verbal vocal. We tend to say a lot, we talk at our kids, and we gesture at them, and our gestures aren't clear. Have you ever been in the car and you've got the person who's directing traffic and they've got the little white gloves on and there's somebody who's having fun with it and they're being very clear, right? And they're going, they go, you, this way, right? And they're going, hmm, hmm, right? And it's very clear to you He's talking to me and I need to go that way. It's great, right? But have you ever had the opposite experience where you have somebody who doesn't know what they're doing directing traffic and they're like doing this and they're whapping their eye and I'm like, are you talking to me? I usually roll down the window and start talking to them and go, I don't understand what you're saying, right? <laughs> Which embarrasses everybody in the car. Um, but if it's not clear, it causes anxiety in me and in a lot of people. We don't want to be causing anxiety when we're giving directions about something that we want somebody to be compliant about. So for instance, if you're having trouble with the morning routine where you're like, oh my gosh, I cannot get them to get dressed, to eat their breakfast, to put stuff in their backpack and get in the car. I really want to encourage you to make a visual schedule. Have some fun while you're doing it. Ask your child to, you know, on, in the middle of an afternoon, say, we're going to do something fun and we're going to take some pictures. And, you know, you go into the bathroom and you take a picture of them brushing their teeth and then you give them the camera and have them take a picture of you brushing the teeth, make this activity fun. But do that with each individual aspect of the morning routine. Maybe not all at the same time, depending on how aversive these things are, right? But you get a bunch of these pictures and then you hang them on the wall. And then you just point to it and, and then if you add whatever fun element that you want to it about, okay, now, you know, for my kid, I would be like, I'm pointing to the picture of the brushing teeth and we're going to race. And then I would go in and brush my teeth in a race with him to come back. And then we come back to the thing, go, okay, now this one, which is putting on the shoes, right? But be clear because for our kiddos that are having trouble with phonemic awareness, or sometimes we're just saying too much, guilty as charged, right? You want to be as concise as possible. And sometimes giving them that visual, you're going to see the compliance. Oh, that's what you want me to do? Oh, I can go brush my teeth. And they also can see where it goes to that we get into the car and make sure there's a reward. That you do each one of these things, you get praise, but when you get in the car, you get your iPad or you get you know, whatever the thing is that is meaningful to your child. But we want to be clear and visuals make it clear. All right, let's move on to number seven. Reward, reward, reward. I can't say enough about this because this is part of what makes it fair. Everybody gets squeamy about this and says, oh, but if you're rewarding, you're setting up this false, da -da 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 -da. no. Um, if you go to work this week and you get a paycheck, then you are part of a system where you're getting rewarded. And if you think about the last time that you were at work and somebody gave you a, a, a shout out and what that made you feel and how you felt about that, it's meaningful. Why would you, my question is, why would you want to withhold that from somebody you love? especially from your child or children on the autism spectrum. They need to be rewarded too. And sometimes in their world where they're not sure, I don't know what this does. I don't know what you're saying to me. I don't know where I'm supposed to be. I don't know where I'm going. I am in myself and I'm feeling this way. You know, 
it can be easy to just sort of turn into yourself and be like, I'm going to be in my own little world because I don't understand what's happening over there. It's not clear to me and there's no clear benefit to me, right? So if we make things clear and we make it rewarding to be with us, rewarding to spend time with us, rewarding to be in the moment with us, we can only be helping to create that trust with them. So think about though, what rewards you. I could line five people up in front of us and they would give me five different things that they personally found rewarding. What does that tell us? We're all different. We're all individual. Don't decide only to reward your child the way you feel rewarded. You can try that and see, does that, does anything change with your child when you reward them the way you like to be rewarded? If it doesn't, try other love languages to see what really helps them to feel rewarded. And remember that what's rewarding to you right now in this moment may not be rewarding to you later on today because your circumstances change. We sometimes, we, the example we always give is chocolate cake. I'm allergic to chocolate. I don't want chocolate cake. That's not going to be a reward for me. If you say, if you do this and I'm going to give you a piece of chocolate cake, I'm going to go, yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> You know, it's not meaningful to me, right? But for somebody else, chocolate cake is absolutely meaningful and they, they'll be like, oh yeah, I want to go have lunch at Aunt Betty's house because Aunt Betty makes chocolate cake and I love that chocolate cake. I have friends that's like, can we go to this restaurant because they have the chocolate cake there? Okay, great, you love the chocolate cake. And maybe they'd be willing, if they love it a lot, maybe they'd be willing to go there once a week. But if we went every night of the week to have chocolate cake, at a certain point, it gets to be enough. Even for people who love chocolate cake, it's like, I have had enough chocolate today. I know there's at least one person watching who's like, no, that could never happen. I could never have enough chocolate. But my point is you can get satiated. That's the term that they use on something. So we want to be checking in with what's meaningful to you right now. How can I reward you right now? Your kids are going to learn and grow and the day is long and things are going to change for them. When they're tired, they're going to want one thing. When they're not tired, they're going to want a different thing. So reward, 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 but pay attention to what they're telling you is meaningful to them. And then remember to reward yourself. Okay, number eight, we might make it. We're not going to punish. Uh, I said this before when we did the rundown, punishment doesn't really work. Um, and 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 it doesn't work long term. I know there are times when fear of punishment works short term, but it never works long term. We had that whole big to do about the tiger mom and the tiger dad all those years ago about, you know, they were like, I don't let my children have a blanket when they sleep because they didn't earn it, right? Uh, and there were people who were listening to those conversations and going, gosh, I guess I need to like, you know, put my children through more trauma. Uh, in order to get them to be the best person that they can be and be a concert pianist. Uh, except that then the children of those people came forward and said, yeah, I don't talk to my parent anymore. And I am traumatized. And the whole, I couldn't wait to get out of their house and I don't ever speak to them anymore, right? Um, so it doesn't really work long term. And here's a key. If, if you punish somebody into doing something or you make them so fearful of punishment so that they won't do something, what happens the minute that you're not there? Do they go ahead and engage in the behavior that you didn't want them to? Then it really wasn't effective. And we have tons of studies about this to show it's not long term effective. So why would we do that with children? I, you know, and I know it's a foreign concept to just take punishment out the window. I remember explaining to my mom early on into ABA when, she, when my son did something and she was flipping out about it. And he did it for, for attention, by the way. I already knew what the function of the behavior was, that he was doing something and he did it for attention. And my mother was like, you're not going to punish him for that? And I said, can you step in the other room with me? And she was like, what is happening right now? Uh, he should be punished. He should stand in a corner or he should be yelled at or, you know, I know you don't believe in paddle in his butt, but, you know, he should be punished for that. And I, and I went into the other room. I was like, yeah, that's so 1975, mom. Uh, <laughs> we're not doing that. He did that to get your attention and it's working if you start giving a bunch of attention. So, um, you know, we're not, we're not doing that. We're doing something else where we're going to reward the behavior that we want to see and we're not going to punish. 
And when it comes to compliance, um, it's really hard sometimes because if you were raised the way I was raised, like it bubbles up and you go, I'm going to, oh no, I'm not punishing that, <laughs> right? I'm not going to do that. It's really, really hard and you're not going to be 100% perfect with it, but I'm telling you, it's a much better strategy to not punish. And especially, um, you know, if we're trying to raise children that are going to be, um, they're going to have a sense of self, they're going to have great self-esteem, and that they're going to feel empowered to say no to people, because all of our children need to say no to people down the road. We want to, as parents, create an environment in which they absolutely never get punished for saying no, across the board. Never a punishment for saying no, and that we get in, in place strategies that are more effective than punishment when, when teaching them all kinds of things. So I'm telling you, don't punish across the board. Don't punish. The only exception I would make is if you are working with a team of professionals who say, we're going to do a cost response for this. And a cost response is considered a punishment strategy where if you, if you hit your sister, you lose your Legos for the day. And if you're working with uh, behavior analysts, they, they're going to use that strategy last. And they're only going to use it when there is bodily injury for somebody else. They're really going to hold off on, because we know it's the least effective strategy. But is it good for short-term things when there's somebody in danger? Yeah. And that's when they'll use it. Otherwise, no punish. No punish. Uh, okay, number nine. Ask them to do something that they want to do. This is the easy key. If you are sitting with your child and your child is being a fuss budget and you are having a non-compliant day and you're like, I don't think this stuff works, Shannon. There's no way that it works. I want you to ask them to do something you know that they already want to do. There was the example of the mom, and I'm not a behavior expert, right? But this I know, and this works. There was the mom who I was talking to, and she was like, uh, it's making us crazy. Our child wants the remote and wants to change channels on the remote endlessly, and it's making us all insane. And, and I was like, well, you know, praise him throughout the day and, you know, talk to your team and whatever. And she was like, I don't think you understand. And he doesn't do anything ever. And I was like, I'm, mm, I want you to look. I'm sure he does something. And I, and I, but if you, you want to get the train on the tracks for compliance, you, you need to get to somehow that you can get to the praise of praising them for something. So I said, well, we already know he wants the remote. So ask him to pick up the remote and put it on a channel that he wants to watch. And then praise him for that. And she was like, but that's the thing that he wants to do. And I was like, exactly. So ask him to do that. Ask him to pick up the remote, put it on the channel, and praise him up and down and say, good job. Good job. And I said, and watch his reaction. And, and she called me back and she was like, I don't know what just happened. I literally don't know what just happened. She said, I asked him to pick up the remote and put it on the channel that he wanted. And, and he did. And she said, and I waited about three minutes and I said, can you now turn the TV off? And he did. And she said, do you want to go in the kitchen and let's make a snack? And he was like, yes. And we went into, she was like, he's a different person. I don't know what just happened. Um, but he got, and then the rest of the day was good too, because it's like you get onto the track. So you ask them to do something that, that you know that they already want to do and you praise them and you give them attention and say, that was really good. And now they're willing to do it again. And I would, in the beginning, ask them to do things that they want to do and things that are highly preferred because we want to show them it's fair. I ask you to do something and it's fair. We're building up what they call behavior momentum. Then I might ask them, okay, now we're going to put on our shoes and get in the car. And I'm going to, you know, and say, but once we get in the car, we're going to go and we're going to go to your favorite store, right? Now, suddenly they're motivated for something that's a little bit further down the road and they're putting on their shoes and they're ready to go. But we've built up that behavior momentum. If, if you're ever in a place where a child is stuck and doesn't want to do something like you're at the grocery store or wherever and you're like, I, I don't know what to do, my child is having a tantrum. One of the things that you can do is, you know, I think of the time when my son was at the Burger King and 
it was time to go and he did not want to go. And I was just in one of those spaces and I picked him up and carried him out because I was like, we have to go. And it was the mother of all meltdowns. If I knew then what I know now, I would be, hey, I would know exactly what he wanted to do, which was to go down the slide one more time. And I would say, hey, I'm going to, how's this? I'm going to ask you to go up as quick as you can, go down that slide. If you can do it in under 30 seconds, we're going to go get a McDonald's toy and then we're going to get in the car. And we would have gone home and there would have been no meltdown. Ask them to do something you know that they already want to do. It puts the train back on the track, and then you can move towards other things that you want them to do that they want to do less. Okay, and number 10, we have to model having boundaries. We're teaching our child to say yes. We're teaching them to say no. We have to show them when we have a boundary. And we do that with them and with other people in front of them. And we say, we language it and say, I don't want to do that. And we show them how we deal with it when, other, when we say, I don't want to do that, and how people deal with that. This is hard because we get afraid. Well, no, then my child is going to say no to everything. I can tell you from experience as a teacher and as a parent, that doesn't happen. You might have a child who goes through a period of time where they'll say no to everything for a little while and then you ask them to do something that they want to do and you praise them and they go, okay, new paradigm. Um, they're not going to say no to everything forever. I know some of you are going to say, no, my child has oppositional defiance disorder. Um, I will tell you that the experts that I talk to say I want to look at that situation and see what, what is fair to the child in that situation before we go, that's a thing for this child. That it's a, I won't say that nobody ever has a qualifying diagnosis for that that really, really exists, because I'm not an expert in that, but I'm telling you that the experts tell me it's worth looking at. How is, what is fair, what is there in a day for them that is fair for them? And if we see that there's very little that's fair, then that's not fair. We need to change that environment. You have to think of it from the perspective of the kiddos, right? That they're going through their day, and in some respects, the child is hostage to our lives, right? And if they don't understand what's happening, it can feel that way for them. We say, okay, now we're gonna leave this cozy, warm place that we're at, and we're gonna go to school. And if our child doesn't understand that school is a fair place or even what school is, why would they be like, okay, let's just go, right? Um, so you're going to model having, having boundaries for your child. You're going to model making it fair for yourself. Um, and that might mean languaging things that are going on in your head saying, I really don't want to go to the store right now. I really don't want to go to the store, but if I don't go to the store, we're not going to be able to have pancakes for breakfast tomorrow. So you know what I'm going to do? Let's go to the store. Let's get the pancake batter at the store. But while we're there, we're going to get this. We're going to get strawberries for the pancakes too. Um, and you talk that through all the things that you do in your head to bargain through, to be able to do things the way you make it fair for yourself. Language it. Language it in front of your children even if you don't know for sure that your children have the uh, receptive language to be able to understand it. Language it because at some point they will be able to understand it and they will understand, oh, this is a thing that people do. This is how they make it for, the, for themselves. Oh, mom doesn't want to go to the grocery store either. This is a news flash to our kids. They think that we think that the grocery store is Disneyland. And as you know, we don't. Um, so model having those boundaries. Talk uh, through all the things that you have going on in your mind so that they can hear that and see that it's important to have boundaries for yourself. That you have likes and dislikes and things that you will not tolerate. That, um, you know, say those things out loud. This is the way that we get to happy children who feel safe, who feel like they can trust us. This is how you get to the point where you're in a situation where something difficult is happening and you can communicate to your child and say, 
right now, you know, we're going to stand back because this thing is going on, or right now we're going to leave the house right away, and they will trust you. They will not, and if we've taught this properly and taught them about stranger danger and about what boundaries we should have with strangers, they will not be people who are just taken advantage of. This is important stuff. Don't be a parent who says, I'm not going to teach compliance and I'm not going to make compliance a part of my child's program because I'm afraid of them being taken advantage of because you actually miss the part of the lesson that teaches them how to not be taken advantage of. But also, don't be a lemming and if your child is doing an ABA program and, and they're only teaching compliance and nobody is teaching them to say no and no one is rewarding them when they say no, get in their faces about that. Make them teach that and you teach that to your child. Don't have them just push compliance all for the sake of compliance. That doesn't work. It doesn't work long term, and if it does, it does set your child up to be somebody who is going to be taken advantage of, and none of us want that. I'm sending you a hug. I know this is a triggering talk. It's very upsetting to think about all the things that you know could go wrong for your child, but let's help them to have ways to language it for themselves so that they feel comfortable to say no and that they're rewarded for that. All right. Uh, we're out of time. We are going to be back next week. We are for, I know for sure we're doing an Ask Dr. Doreen, and I know for sure we're doing at least one Autism Live next week, if not two. So stay tuned for all of that. I also have to give two shout-outs that right now, uh, if you haven't already bought your tickets for the All Ghouls Gala, that's the Halloween party fundraiser. It's an adult fundraiser being done by Autism Care Today. You really need to get your tickets because it's going to sell out, I think, be, you know, like by the end of next week. So you need to get your tickets. Remember that Dr. Temple Grandin's going to be there, Joe Montaigne, Ariva Martin. We've got so many other celebs that I, I, I'm not allowed to say yet, but by next week I should be able to say some of the other celebs who are going to be there. And it's going to be a really, really fun time. I'll be there. Dr. Grampy Shea will be there. Dr. Temple Grandin will be there. Joe Montaigne will be there. And Ariva Martin will be there. I mean, you should like really enjoy that alone, but then there will be other things as well. Um, so that. The other thing I want to say, and uh, normally we would, we would have done a Let's Talk Movies with Moira and we would have talked about that, but because I'm so busy, we haven't been able to do that. Um, but the Taka Conference is not this weekend, but it is the next weekend after this. It's the Friday, Saturday, and Sunday morning, and Oh my gosh, you guys, if you are in California already, then you should be a regional center client and you should ask them. They will fund you going to that conference, the tickets. Um, and it's well worth it. it. It is such a good time. I will be there on Friday and Saturday. I don't know if I'm going to be there on Sunday morning, but I'm speaking on Friday morning. And then Dr. Temple Grandin is the keynote speaker on Saturday morning. So, you know, um, and there's so many people there, so many talks. I go just for the resource fair because the resource fair is amazing. Um, if you can get to it, great. If you can't, I really want to encourage encourage you while they're low cost to buy a virtual ticket which will give you all the talks will be recorded and it'll give them to you I think up until January 1 maybe it's December 31st um, and it's a very low cost and you can watch them and learn from them I don't know a single person who's ever been to or watched a Taka uh, presentation that didn't go oh my gosh that just refreshed my batteries and I know more of what to do moving on so I encourage you, tacanow.org, go there, get your tickets in person or virtual. If you can be there, fabulous. Make sure you come up to me and introduce yourself so that, you know, if you're, a, I'm a hugger. If you're a hugger, we'll hug it out. If not, I'll just be happy to look at your smiling face. Uh, that's coming up, not this week, but next week. All right. Uh, we will be back next week with more Autism Live and more Ask Dr. Doreen. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. 
You can also follow us on Twitter and on Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. See you next time.